evening. I'm Melissa Idris. And I'm Sharad Kutten. You're watching Consider This. Today on the show, we have Dr. Alexander Gerlach, who is a senior fellow at the Carnegie Council for Ethics in International Affairs. And he's also a columnist at DW. He's got a column called Gerlach Global, which touches on the future of democracy and the liberal world order, which is precisely what we're going to be discussing today. Welcome to the show, Alex. Thank you for having me. Wonderful. So, you know, we're going to be um, celebrating the 30th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall this Saturday. And I wanted to talk to you about the Germany you grew up in and the Germany of today. So talk to us a bit about how Germany has changed and the assumptions that you once grew up with are now being challenged. Yeah, uh, thank you. I, like, I was 13 years old when the war came down, literally like until very, like, let's say the summer of the year. Nobody would have thought it and deemed it possible the wall ever to come down. So we were like literally like surprised when we saw how the people like took the streets like in the weeks before the wall came down and how it was literally like effectively with one stroke of a pen or like one sentence of this one functionary of the Communist Party was just like open for all Germans. It was like a very, a very joyous night. Um, in result, it meant to me, um, and I, I re realized this years later in my work as a journalist, actually, I had a colleague who was 10 years younger than me, and he wrote um, a self-description, and he said he grew up, he became politically aware in the time between 9-11 and the, the Lehman Brothers collapse of the bank, and I thought, wait a minute, so I became politically aware after the fall of the Berlin Wall, how positive this time was. You know, like when I was a child, you could not go like very far east from where I'm from, there was like the Iron Curtain that divided Europe. Mm. And my like adolescence and then my me being a young man and a student, actually the world was free and was open and that basically shaped my idea of the world. Right. You know, one of the most recent headlines we had coming out of Germany was uh, the city council of Dresden, you know, declared a Nazi crisis, you know, along like in uh, analogous to a sort of ecological crisis. And I know there's been there's the complexities of that story, but uh, it sort of signals a Germany where there's a resurgent right wing um, and, that we, and part of the European story. I mean, does that surprise you that and coming from what is formerly the East Germany? So what happened after the, after the end of the Second World War, so the Eastern sector was taken by the Russians and the other three were the other like allies, France, Britain and the United States. And that in the West, what became Western Germany, they started a denazification. And um, this was also like a hard endeavor. It took like one generation in the 60s, 80s, as we called them, you know, the time when this global like um, um, movement broke. And then these children would ask their parents, Dad, what did you do in the war? So even in Western Germany, it took a long time until denazification denazification took a strong hold. Having said that, in the eastern part, however, where the Russians took over, it would not, did not deploy into democracy, so there was like the next dictatorship moving in, and so what they did was they just declared Nazidom over without like having like a public sort of like movements and like, you know, as we had in, in Western Germany, which leads in effect to that Nazis were never a Nazidom or the thoughts of or the ideologies of the Nazis was, was never defeated. So after the war came down in 1989 and 1990, you, you, we now we see like reports about like how, how students in school, in high school back then debated like, I mean, but Nazi thoughts have been around forever. They were just like covered up under the, the communist uh, era and the communist dictatorship and now you see like for the new right-wing party which we unfortunately have in western germany there's like 10 percent of people rooting for them but in eastern germany it's up to 30. so you clearly right. see there's a difference because in eastern germany there was never like a period where they like denazificated okay. you know one of the things that you suggest is that ideas never die mm. Mm. and even bad ideas remain with us right and so the question of whether democracies can uh, remain true to their core while keeping hold of this. Like an, uh, an expression that you've used in the past, you know, can, how do the tolerant deal with the intolerant? How do you, how do you, can you unpack that for us? I mean, yeah, so like when we talk about liberal democracy, literally we mean like the iteration of democracy we have nowadays. And that entails a few things. When we look like back, far back into history, like in the antiquities, only the man, the father of the family could go and engage in politics. Until a hundred years ago, women were not allowed to vote. So now nowadays our iteration of democracy now says us basically, there is not such a thing as the dominion of a majority over a minority. If you win an election this, this time, maybe next, 
time another party wins or even you as a voter you may change affiliation so like it's a p it's about the society as a whole and the society has majorities and minorities but they all have to somehow like get along with one another mm. and that's basically what liberal uh, democracy means so and there is no such thing as a non-liberal democracy nowadays because we don't want to go back to the times where women had no suffrage right so that's actually the the setup of democracy and nowadays you find these like they call themselves illiberals and what they mean is like we define who the majority is and the, the majority rules over the minorities and period and that's not what we have deployed after the horrors of the second world war and the Shoah. Right. So, so then why are these you know, ideas that never die, why are these ideas seeing emergence once again, 30% in East Germany said. It's also like a, a global phenomenon. Like, look, when you, when you, I'm not, I'm, I'm not shying away from the German question, but I give a broader concept here. Like, in America, when Barack Obama was elected president, he was highlighting uh, that he ha is of Kenyan descent and he has relatives all over the planet and he made and labeled this an American story. And it's actually true. It's a very cosmopolitan one and shows you that you are connected to other parts of the world. Whereas when Donald Trump uh, came about, he's, n he's not, he's never getting tired to say he's a nationalist. And what he means by that is in uh, American terms he's an isolationist so there is like I'm saying this neither Donald Trump invented this idea nor did Barack Obama invent this idea the idea and the struggle to whether or not the United States are a cosmopolitan nation or a white nation for white people is uh, is around since the foundation of the nation mm. and so it's like the Germans have always had like the question are we Western are we like looking towards the East so and this is what they call it the German Sonderweg Weg, the particular way of the Germans and nowadays you find in Germany lots of people like leaning towards the United States and you find all also people leaning towards Russia because Germany is geographically like um, yo well positioned in the middle in the of middle, Europe. Yeah. <laughs> However having said that specifically because of the Nazi past I believe like democratic ideas have set root very quickly in Germany and the German society has become rather liberal over the course of the last 70 years because they did not want to see uh, history repeating itself. All right, we're going to continue this conversation on the liberal world order in just a couple of minutes right here on Consider This. Make sure you stay tuned. Welcome back to Consider This. I'm Melissa Idris with me, Shirai Kutin, and we're chatting to Dr. Alex Gerlach about the world order, the liberal world order. I want to pick up on something that you said uh, be just before the break and to kind of put it into context of what's happening around the world. We're seeing the, a spate of uh, protests around the world. Talk to me a little bit about um, how perhaps the democracy, the uh, democracy model that we know of, perhaps you know, the American democracy, uh, model of democracy, may no longer be relevant in today's age. The, after the Second World War, in the Pacific and in Western Europe, the United States deployed like a, a model, if you will, that was like, let's not talk about politics first. Let's just try to build something together economically. Mm. And that's happened in, in again, the Pacific and Western Europe. And then it, the, the so-called um, economic miracle took off in, in Germany. And what, what, what happened in, in that time was like, if you went to school, if you worked hard, you could just had a better living and a better living. And social inequalities, when they arose, they were also like then, you know, what some would say covered up or paid or whether by social by social welfare and this happened th through indebting and nowadays we live in a world where uh, natural resources shrink where we don't have interest rates anymore as we used to be so mm. this whole model that's based on growth uh, will be coming to, a, to an end and we all know it and now also we see like the scarcity the alleged or the real scarcity in, in goods kicking in and this is why people cannot be like or are not as keen as they used to be a few decades ago to also like help others being like cosmopolitan in the true sense of the word, it means like we are engaged with the whole human family sure. and now we realize people retrieve to kinship and family and this is due to the crisis of the economic model. What about the European story? We know uh, Germany is deeply embedded in the cornerstone of the European ideal of a federated Europe. Um, where is that going? Perhaps not a Scandinavian model of welfareism, but some sort of social democratic compact that is, in, as you say, underpin the democratic experiment in Europe. Is that something that's still worth saving? 
Well, I feel that's actually, if you look on the global map, that's what makes Europe special, that it found a middle ground of like capitalism and communism and socialism, if you will, that like, that we in Europe, we acknowledge the market, but the market can never be unhinged. So in that sense, we are a little more, we are a little closer to the Chinese even, where, where they have like, they, uh, they invest into infrastructure. Europeans would always invest into, into infrastructure and say, this is kind of a common good. Yeah. Whereas in the United States, when you say like, oh, we invest in that, people say, well, that's socialism. So I feel that the European model actually in, our, in, in today's world has the, 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 the most bandwidth, if you will, to cope with these, with these developments nowadays. Uh, well, I want to kind of uh, talk about the G0 world, right? That mm. Where we, there's that kind of a vacuum of political and economic leadership uh, from the world's superpowers, once with the world's superpowers. I mean, all these, um, I guess, decision makers are so fixated on addressing some of the domestic crises that no one is actually taking leadership for the, uh, gl the global leadership. And I think that could come with an array of consequences in the midterm and the, the long term. Um, talk to me about where you see Europe in this, specifically Germany. Is there, is, is there a position for Europe to be leading the world when it comes to making these decisions? So, I mean, literally, I mean, I totally agree with your anal analysis in Germany as an export nation is like very much focused on, on this aspect. So when it comes to talking to foreign powers, like let's say the People's Republic of China, it will always be like the, the economic interest first. Having said that, however, and I, th I feel also the Germans, because they are as powerful as they are nowadays, they are one of the few nations that then actually also can say something about the right. human rights issues. So when former uh, 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 head of, st of state Joachim Gauck went to China, and saw President Xi Jinping, they had like 90 minutes FaceTime and I'm sure he brought up some human rights issues. So this is like a good example nowadays where uh, soft power and hard power, if you will, go hand in hand because the United States have obviously like under Donald Trump retrieved from this sort of uh, soft power approach and this is why we see a vacuum nowadays and China has been eager uh, trying to filling it. What about the US? Where does the US sit? I mean, you've spent time in the US in the last uh, few years. Where do you see America in this G0 world? It's, it's literally st astonishing, like 25 years ago, uh, Samuel Huntington wrote this book of, about the clash of civilizations and he predicted that the world will be like, not be bipolar anymore, will have like lots of centers of gravity, if you will. Mm -hmm. And the Western world in his, I in his idea was like one of many, but still led by the United States of America. Uh, and he would be like, he would like be looping in his grave. He would be seeing like, what the heck's going on nowadays? So literally the, what we perceive as the Western world is like in a deep crisis because the United States has given up on its leadership role. Mm. So was com coming back to Europe and, and some of the uh, debacles we see Brexit, the big issue around <laughs> Brexit is, is the failure of Europe to respond, uh, we are told, uh, to the, the needs of Britons, right? They, their aspirations or their suspicion about Brussels and so on and so forth. Uh, we also see it in, in Italy and so on and so forth. Do you think that Europe has kind of turned the corner on that? Or is that something that's going to stay with Europe for a long time? And intellectuals like yourself, I mean, where do you stand in the discussions about where Europe should be or aspire to be? I, the thing is, like, globalization has brought upon us, like, a new, like, global middle class, if you will, but at the same time, it has also like delivered like a new lower class. And this is like very difficult to disentangle. You see like rising GDPs, but this is like due, uh, Chile, for instance, outside of Europe, but still, uh, but that's due to automatization leads to more uh, eff efficiency in their productivity. So if you look at the GDP, you say, oh, everything is great. But then if you look, uh, assuming that that means people have more money in their pockets, wi which they don't. Even in Germany, like let's say the workforce is about 40 million people, so 9 million people uh, work in the low income sector mm. so literally they serve in a in a coffee shop like um and uh, where they make like 750 an hour like a coffee like uh, you know like a super fancy coffee for the same <laughs> money they work for an hour and then they see like people like uh, uh you know just in 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 the hundreds a day who, who can spend this money they make in one hour uh, francis fukuyama in his recent book on identity uh, called this like the feeling of indignation mm. so when people like go and work and they do not make enough to meet ends that creates like this feeling of like I'm I do not belong I cannot participate and if you are like a, a, a father mother and two children and visiting the cinema costs you a hundred dollars then clearly you feel like disentangled and that is a crisis of democracy because democracy lives by the promise that people can participate in the public sphere what about the identity of Europe as, as a 
as a coming together of Christian nations. And I know uh, in Germany there is an organization called Pakida, mm. uh, which is anti-Muslim. Um, and, and, but does that go to a, a deeper problem about how Europeans identify themselves, kind mm. of on the surface, secular, but actually with, uh, with deeply held notions about them being Christian. Mm, mm. So there has been last year, there has been a survey by the Pew Institute in DC, and that was like the results were rather astonishing. So they asked about Christian affiliation across Europe. Uh, so 90% of the surveyed answered they are baptized. So they remember that at some point they were made Christians, obviously. So that 90%, that means like by numbers, this is still like a, a Christian continent, if you, wanna, if you wanna call it like that. 70% said they would, Christian values, whatever that means, matter in their life. 20% out of them only go to church every week. So clearly religion had, in, like in many other parts of the world, has a public dimension. It also has a political dimension. So Christianity is still one of the pillars of, of today's Europe, at least in the assumptions of its populace. So this is why when you are an immigrant from a, a Muslim nation, for instance, that is that raises to many like some suspicions about loyalty and about belonging. Also like on the other hand by the people who come to our countries. However, I'd also say the notion is like that um, religion, where if religion matters, it's also the question like it's not about the past but about the future and the present. So in the refugee crisis there were lots of debates about to what does it mean actually to be a Christian continent? What do, do we have to help the refugees and to what extent? So just to hold it like the Pegida people, they are called patriotic Europeans for the, for, to save Europe from Islamization. And literally they take off like in a part of Germany which used to be like uh, in the communist uh, part of Germany, like in Dresden, as you said. And there's the percentage of Christians in that city is 10%. And you see like in many parts of Europe, like um, the people who are, have never seen a foreigner, who have never seen a Muslim are the most against them. Mm. So like liberal values as in terms of cosmopolitan values or democratic values as in terms of tolerance, they are very much upheld like in metropolis areas. And if you look into also that Fukuyama wrote this in his book, like if you look for a common denominator in the Brexit vote and the vote for Donald Trump, it's not socioeconomic, it's not age, it's not gender, it's the population density. So as, more, as less populated the region is, as more inclined people are to buy in all these us versus them narratives. Okay, so what can we learn from that? I mean, y using that premise, what, it, what can we learn about the spread of these ideas? So in, in I feel hum in, uh, in, in Europe, and we spoke about religion now, uh, when human rights came about in the 16th century, the notion of that, it was about religious toleration. So, and I feel this is still very, very high up there and when Europeans talk about it, but there's also like there's iterations in the, our understanding of human rights. And now, coming back to what we said about the global economic crisis, there is also like human rights for fresh air, uh, clean water and all this. And that also in the end means like a fair and just uh, economic system. And this is what we have to learn, I believe. Uh, and this is also an example that Europe can give to the world, like how we iterate our idea and notion of human rights. All right, we're going to continue this conversation in just a couple of minutes. Make sure you stay tuned to consider this. Welcome back to Consider This, Melissa and Chara chatting to Dr. Alex Gerlach. He also has a, um, is the editor-in-chief of an online magazine on technology, AI and ethics called The Human Condition. Yes? Sure. Uh, so you've been in media, you've actually been a journalist, uh, apart from all your, uh, your many uh, um, academic qualifications. I just want to ask you from a practical point of view. As journalists, we struggle to make sense of the world for our readers, for our viewers, right? Um, but we come with different values. How has the media, as you see it, the public sphere, more generally the media in it, uh, played a role? I mean, have we made things worse? Have we failed in some sense to uh, uh, make sense of the world for our viewers and therefore have not helped um, um, mitigate the, the worst tendencies? You know, mm. we've gone for the devils rather than the angels in our nature. So the, uh, Almost 50 years ago, Alvin Toffler wrote a book that was called The Future Shock. And I sum it up for you, it's one sentence, it's easy. He said like, at some point, uh, um, uh, progress is so fast that even elites in societies cannot uh, comprehend it. So if you believe that 
that media is like, you know, the marketplace, the, the sphere, the public sphere in which all ideas are debated and therefore also belonging like a little bit what you would call to elites or to, yeah, the elites in society. I feel so many things have happened in the last 10, 15 years, also to our industry, if you will, mm. by the internet and like struggling with our business models, that we are also not capable of explaining uh, as we used to because the world has gotten more complex. And this is like, if you look into the radical movements we have been talking about, it's not only people that are deprived economically who vote for Donald Trump or for Brexit. It's also like people from the former elite who want to make sense of the world. So I wouldn't say necessarily we, are, we made the problem bigger, but we were definitely not immune to it. I, I do want to know also, I mean, the idea that at the moment, you know, social media has amplified everything, every single idea from around the world. You can find someone out there who agrees or disagree with you. And with your, your online magazine called The Human Condition, I find that fascinating. How we as humans are responding to this because the way we consume information has changed drastically. And what's that, what that has led to has been this crisis of trust within mm. not just uh, the media but also each other because of the information that's out there. Um, could you help unpack that a little bit for us? Maybe. I mean, I started off in German television in Mainz. That's the city where my dad is from. Also where Gutenberg invented printing, so we are very proud to humanism yeah. and enlightenment. But I'm saying, like, what made us actually facilitate the public sphere until very recently. Journalistic practice, yes, all great, good ethos, yeah, but also technological advancement. Like when I was in German television, mm. a camera was 50,000 marks. Now I have like, where is it here? Yeah, like in my cell phone, everywhere. we have all like really <laughs> good, like, uh, so that means also like another thing, like in back in the days, we had like when my dad would buy a, na a national newspaper, he paid a lot of money for someone going down to the archives and just like, f you know, putting together the information that he needed for this article. So also this is gone to, in, to a certain extent. So media is not the public sphere anymore as they used to be. They're not the platform anymore. And actually when I say platform, it's always alluding, already alluding to Facebook and Twitter. They became the platforms and media entities are now also part of their platforms. Mm. And this is, some, this is a shift in society that also we have to, uh, as media people, have to like comprehend. But also it's like a general thing that everybody has to learn in the society. And even the technology companies themselves. I mean, sure. I'm not giving them any credit, but like also like you should not be like all too critical in that sense because they also had to learn what uh, what power they now obtained and like Google and Facebook they, they said like for a long time oh we are only platforms but then they realized yeah we are actually more than that okay so you have Gutenberg who, who get the printing press but I understand that uh, the genius really uh, was with uh, Luther that hmm. Luther in uh, in developing a, a German Bible in the language that Luther used really popularized Christianity and mm. a way of talking and it created a shared language. Is that something that we lack today? We all seem to speak English or elites are globally, but do we actually share the same frameworks, the same you know, kind of uh, 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 substratum to kind of uh, comprehend the world. I can only speak from the German context here because that I know the best. But like, do you have this this narrative now saying, oh, politicians don't care and they're up here and the normal people are down there? I don't think that's accurate. I know lots of parliamentarians, MPs from from uh, all uh, all angles of, of the democratic spectrum, and they are highly invested in their constituency. But what I feel in terms of what I said about indignation earlier, it's like. If you wake up in the morning and you have a job to go to and some, something to look forward to, you cannot understand the hermeneutical gap you cannot like cross for some people, for the people who don't. Yeah. And this is, I feel like, the disenfranchise, that's not only materialistically, what happened after the, um, after the, the crisis in America in 2008, people are very disappointed that Obama had bailing out the banks but not the homeowners. It's this question of fairness. And that's, I think that's something that is very difficult to, to, to comprehend. This is my last book, was on empathy. It was called Homo Empathicals, where I try to make the case for that. Empathy means not, you know, it's not only just, um, empathy is a mix of reason and emotion. You try to make sense of things. And I feel this is like what you, when you talk about a common language, I feel that's what's missing. Like Europe cannot take in all refugees from Africa that want to cross the Mediterranean, but it should be trying to understand why mm -hmm. they want to cross. So in order to make better policies for them and also for us. And if you lack empathy, like the populists, the Pegida and the AFD people, like they run completely on resentment. And resentment is not capable of making like a, a good assessment. Like the, one of the chairs of the so-called alternative for Germany, this right-wing party, 
was now asked twice in a row in the so-called summer interviews, uh, what is the pension, the idea of the pension reform of his party? And literally two times in a row he said, we don't have any. So the point is like, if you, if you are busy hating Muslims, foreigners <laughs> and whatever, you have no time left to make constructive policies. And that's, I feel, what we lack. Okay, Alex, mm -hmm. you've been around the world, uh, mm -hmm. you know, you've been, you've been visiting different countries, you've been listening to what's happening on the ground, and you've been giving talks, right? Um, talk to us about where you see the future of democracy heading uh, and the liberal world order, given everything that you've picked up on your travels. Yeah, and uh, the, like the alternatives to that, they label it as illiberal democracies or communitarian democracies. I feel what we need to be finding is like, what in Latin is called the bonum commune. What are we? Why? Are, what's the common good? What is the best for the the best? You, uh, the best for the greatest number of people. And I mean, I, you know, there is like talk in Amer America about corporate America and profits, which back in the days also helped like, you know, tiny shareholders and whatnot. But it's not about, it's not the interest that should be at the core is the interest of all of us. And not like the people in the sense of the communist rhetoric or, or a nationalistic rhetoric. It's clearly nowadays we, we are living so close together that it matters to you here if the Amazon is burning. And when, when, if we then turn to the Brazilian government and they say it's none of your business you say yes it is but it's like and this is something that we that I picked up on on my on my on my journeys that we talk about Mm, um, climate change is a topic that we cannot solve in a national context. We cannot solve the, re the refugee crisis in a national context, and that's true. But I would say, moreover, we also have to find a fair understanding how the economy should be looking like in the future. Right. And I feel that's the most the most pressing Agree. point. Okay, we have less than a minute. <laughs> Are you pessimistic or are you optimistic about the future of humanity? So you mentioned Martin Luther, which was <laughs> the ref and even though I'm a Catholic, I may quote him. He said, "If I knew the world would perish tomorrow, I would still be planting an." apple tree today oh. and I feel as a, as a German Catholic not being a Lutheran but still he invent, he made our our language what it is today and I think he has a good point here we should always be staying optimistic we should always oh. be planting <laughs> yes, that apple we should. tree all <laughs> right there you go unfortunately we've run out of time that's all the time we have on this episode of consider this thank you so much for speaking this thank you for having me a wonderful conversation we will be back with more conversations tomorrow night at 10 p.m. on consider this I'm Melissa Idris signing off with Sharad Kutin thank you for watching